about his work, which is represented in the exhibition, Staring Back, in which you are sitting, in the middle of. Um, Damien was born and raised in England in a family of portrait painters. And um, in an effort to kind of go his own way, he first studied screenwriting at Harvard, and then in the 80s began to hear the call of painting, <laughs> answered it, <laughs> and has never looked back. <laughs> He, from the mid-1980s to 2000, um, he traveled around the world painting and sometimes living in locales that included Paris, um, Cartagena in Colombia, Morocco, Rome in the South Seas, and then settled in southern Colombia from 1993, where he lived until 2000, when he and his family moved to Los Angeles. His work has been exhibited internationally for many years and is represented in numerous public and private collections. And among the private collections are those of many Hollywood actors and uh, directors, producers, and writers, and a host of other creative individuals that are associated with the filmmaking industry. He began a series of artist studios in 2001. He is painting in the exhibition that hangs over here. And then it also appears in a video projection that was done by Cody Brownell, Cogelin Brownell, who's back here with us. It's kind of a collaboration, Damien in Absentia. I love it. He likes it. So uh, I was thrilled to be able to get uh, the painting of Picasso's studio in the Bateau Lavoir 1908, which is the painting of Damien's that hangs here in part because this exhibition is about Picasso's creative process. And I want to read a, a piece written by Anthony Hayden Guest about Damien's work that reads as follows. Elwes recreates the studios of Picasso, Matisse, Warhol, and Duchamp not as mere documents frozen in time, but rather as images that capture the power, spirit, and imagination of an artist during some of the most frenzied moments in their creative history. Elwes carefully scrutinizes photographs and other documents pertaining to a particular artist's studio, but when he actually begins the painting, his goal is to capture more than the mere space where these activities take place. Instead, he proposes to give a glimpse into the creative process itself. So please join me in welcoming Damien Elwes. Firstly, thank you so much, Jamie Cohen, for, and the Fleming Museum for including my work in this exhibition and for inviting me to come and speak here. And you've created a wonderful and innovative exhibition and I'm very, very happy to be a part of it. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna introduce you to my wife, Luann, <laughs> my daughter, Cosima, at the top, and my son, Aubrey. And my children are teenagers now um, so this was a few years ago, it goes too fast. Um, but this is, we were exploring some uh, prehistoric statues in, in Colombia. Right? Turn my phone off. Um, so, tonight I'm gonna talk about, we'll tell you a few stories, how I became a painter how I came to meet this painting of the Bateau Lavoir studio, what I learned in the process, and why I make paintings of artist studios. When I was a child, I loved to make drawings. My father and grandfather were portrait painters, and from an early age, it was thought that I too would become a painter. This is a little drawing that I did at nine years old, a few weeks after being gored by a bull in a Spanish fiesta. <laughs> almost killed. <laughs> um, 
My father lived in Spain, not far from Malaga, which of course is where Picasso spent his childhood. So we talked about Picasso a lot. And, and uh, my father painted portraits, and he once let me fill in the sky in one of his paintings. He also shared some advice that he'd received from his father. A face is never just pink. Try to see all the colors that exist in that face. My grandfather was a member of the Royal Academy. And in the 20s and 30s, he painted the scions of European and American society, the Whitney's, the Churchill's, Lady Bird Johnson, all the crowned heads of Europe, including Queen Elizabeth and her father, George VI. And this is him actually painting George VI. When I was 13, I was sent to Harrow School. And this is a drawing of the old schools at Harrow, which is one of my favorite buildings there. Um, all the classrooms inside are made of wood. And um, people have been allowed to carve their names into the wood. So everyone from Byron to Churchill, you can go around and see thousands and thousands of names. And consequently, the desks and the walls and the floor, everything has become a sculpture of names. And so in my last year, I took a pen knife in and I added my name to it as well, because <laughs> that's what you do. My mathematical ability helped me to get into Har Harvard, yes. And, but there I studied poetry and modern theater. I had a wonderful playwriting professor called Bill Alfred. And his teaching style was to listen to one's piece, go to his bookshelf, and then select some books that would help you improve. Well, at graduation, or just before graduation, he went to his bookshelf and he found this palette knife that had once belonged to Henri Matisse. Matisse had given it to Alice B. Toklas, who was Gertrude Stein's girlfriend, and Alice B. Toklas had given it, given it to Bill, and Bill gave it to me. And I said, you don't like my playwriting. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, there's something you're avoiding in life. And it's apparent in all of the stories that you tell. After graduation, I went to New York and worked as a PA for Sidney Lumet on a film about Greta Garbo. It was the early 80s, and New York was just full of graffiti we'd see a huge Basquiat painting on the wall one week, and then we'd return to it a few a week later, and hundreds of other people had put paint all over it. So the paintings were really metamorphosing. And up until that point, I'd really thought of painting as dead because my father and grandfather died when I was 15, and I had kind of put away all of their, they'd left me all of their things, their easels and brushes and everything, and I put that all into storage. And, and I didn't really want to be a painter at that point. But now I began to see certainly this style of painting, graffiti, was really alive because it was metamorphosing and, and it was something that really interested me. So my job on the film was mostly just crowd control. And, um, but one afternoon, I was keeping people into a subway station so they didn't go into the, in front of the camera. And in there, I saw Keith Herring painting on a subway wall. And I struck up a conversation with him because I was there all afternoon and we started chatting and I told him how much I was excited about graffiti painting and how much I really wanted to give it a try. And he said, well, he invited me and said, just do some painting on my painting. And I said, um, Keith, you know, I think I'm a little too English to paint on your painting. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> but um, we went to a party later and uh, he encouraged me to go get a box of spray paint and find a wall and, and, and make my own paintings. And, and that's exactly what I did. And, uh, and luckily, I knew actually about an entire building on West 56th Street in New York um, that was condemned and wasn't going to be knocked down for a year. And it, I knew about it because Sidney Lumet's office had been in there. And he moved out, as did everybody else in the building. There were ballet studios. It was huge. And I had the keys. <laughs> so I let myself in one weekend with some spray paint. And I started painting in there. 
And I remember the first day I painted an entire room and then I passed out because I didn't have a mask on and I hadn't opened the windows. And I blew my nose and colors came out of my nose. And I looked around and I saw, my goodness, this is my whole subconscious. It's like a dream out here, all these colors and everything. And I was very, very interested and I went back and I went back and I went back and my parents weren't too pleased. They said, well, if you're going to become a painter, why did you have to rethink, why did you have to waste money on Harvard? You could have just become a painter. And I, I think I said something like, well, it's not so bad to be an educated painter, is it? <laughs> so within a year, I was befriended by a top New York art, uh, London art dealer called Robert Fraser. And, um, and my paintings, he put my paintings in a show with Basquiat and Herring in London. And um, I want to tell you one other little story about this place is that there's, the city kept locking me out and putting bigger and bigger locks on the door. <laughs> And so I thought, well, I'm going to lose all my paintings one day if, it, if I can't get in. So how am I going to get in? So I looked behind the building uh, and the fire escapes at the back of the building were very close to the fire escapes to a hotel um, that still exists there. And then I'm going to stay in tomorrow, actually, just, to, just to, because I want to go back there. And, um, and I looked at all the rooms in there and I saw that there was one room on the seventh floor that was just full of old furniture. And everything was gray in there. And sure enough, at night, the lights never went on. So I, looked, so I climbed across, because it was very close to the fire escape, went to the seventh floor, and the window just opened. And I went in there, and I first went to the bathroom and turned on the tap, and there was water. So that was great, because there was none in my place. So that became my entranceway to my studio. And, and I would buy a newspaper every morning, and after a while, the people in the hotel lobby thought I lived there. And then, good morning, Mr. Elvis, good morning. And I'd buy my newspaper, <laughs> go up to the sun floor. So when Robert Fraser came to New York to find graffiti artists for a show that he wanted to do in England, he sent his assistant, who now has a big gallery in London, and he sent Gerard. And Gerard came over, and we went through the whole lobby, and they, good morning, Mr. Elvis, good morning. I bought my newspaper, we went up to the seventh floor. I'd put the door, I'd seen it in some movie, I'd put a bit of tape on the on the door so I could take my credit card and just open it. We went in, I changed into my painting clothes, we go out onto the fire escape into the next thing and Gerard said, listen, I don't care what you're painting, this is so cool, you're in the show. <laughs> so, so, yeah. And so, and these, the ones that I'm showing you, these were the rooftops, there were huge um, artist studios on the top floor that had the huge skylights. And so these are the backs of the skylights. And yes, I just, I painted everything, the whole roof, the, or every room, everything. And then I went back to London and um, I led kind of a dual existence there. My friends and family really didn't know that I was making graffiti, but in the, at nighttime, I would go and walk around the streets of London and find um, buildings like this, where uh, there were these beautiful forgotten walls and, and make paintings there. Mm -hmm. And um, in the daytime, I'd go back with a Polaroid camera and photograph them. And my, f yes. And so after a while, though, I decided that I needed to paint with a brush. And this is a little etching that I did. Um, imagine, <coughs> I did have a little tiny studio at that point. I didn't have a model, but it's a little bit of imagination. And I made a little exhibition of etchings. Um, and I made about 3,000 pounds. And this is me in the bath with a little calendar of the Eiffel Tower on. I made enough money to go to Paris. And I decided that I was going to go to Paris and learn to paint with a brush. And so that was, that was my plan. Oops. Ah. Um, well, once I got to Paris, I moved into a cheap hotel in Montmartre. And then I went in search of the Bateau Lavoie, the crumbling studio building which Picasso had made famous. Sadly, I discovered that it no longer existed and it had burned to the ground in the 70s. So instead, I went to the Pompidou Center and for a whole afternoon, I sat in front of this painting uh, made by Henri Matisse, interior with a violin case. And there was a Picasso painting right next to it, actually, of a muse. And <coughs> inadvertently, tears started coming down my cheeks because I realized at that point, until that point, I thought, well, I could do anything in life. I'd been to Harvard, I could start a business, I could um, be a writer. So many things seemed open to me. But at this moment, I realized that I was in love with form and with color, and that 
Bill was right and that I knew what I had to do. And the next day, I went to a place that's also a museum in Paris called Gustav Moreau's Studio. And I made this drawing sitting on a spiral staircase between the two studios. You could see both studios. And this is where Matisse had learned to paint. And that's why I went there. And uh, I, while I, was, I really enjoyed making this drawing. And while I was doing it, I had an idea. Instead of going to art school, I spent the next two years going around every studio that I could find in Paris and asking the artists, could I make a drawing of your studio? And really, I was just, it was just a way to, to watch them. Um, and usually the artists were so busy, but when they heard my studio, a drawing, they were charmed by that and they let me sit in the corner all afternoon long and make my drawings. And um, I would really just be watching them painting or sculpting or making prints or uh, collaging or whatever else they were doing. And I was learning their methods. And I experienced an extraordinary part of Paris that very few get to see. This is the first little watercolor I made there um, in one of the studios that really fascinated me the most. And I kept going back to actually many, many times. And it was owned by a man called René Coutel, an artist called René Coutel. There were three huts surrounding a little garden and he was out there working in rain or snow every day. And a big block of marble was very, or any kind of stone, was very expensive for him. So every piece of, that he cut off the stone, he'd make that into a little maquette, a little model of what that uh, sculpture was going to be. And consequently, the garden was full of thousands of little sculptures, some hanging from the trees. Around every scu big sculpture, there was at least 20 little sculptures. And so I, I was really fascinated by that garden. And at lunchtime, we would all sit around a little warm stove and uh, his wine glasses were all broken. The bases were not gone. Um, but he'd, so he'd drilled holes in the statues around us and <laughs> put your wine glass in there. And he'd take the baguette every lunch and he'd carve it into whatever he was doing. So it was a woman or a dove or whatever it was. And, and, uh, and I made a huge painting of him carving his baguette. That really, anyway, so I just thought you wouldn't want to hear about one of the artists that I, and, um, but so really there was just so much to learn from all of the studios and every place that there was, just the way that artists places his things tells you so much. And uh, I, I got that from there. And that's how I started as a painter and how I came to make paintings of artist studios. For me, each studio that I've ever painted has been a new learning experience. And there's so much that one can learn from all the items that the artist has collected and uh, the way they place their things. But the studios that I really yearned to go to were those of Matisse and Picasso. This is Matisse's studio, but painted 20 years later, because in those days, I really didn't know how to get into those studios. I was only 23 and I didn't know how to gain access. It was like always a concierge and these, these places have become fancy apartments mostly. Um, so it wasn't until 20 years later that I returned um, with my catalogs of my work and all of the research that I'd done over many, many years of each of these studios. and. Um, I'd become a little bit of a detective and I knew better how to get into these places and I'll tell you about those later. So after Paris, I went to Morocco and I painted in all the places where Matisse and Delacroix had painted. And I just learned about the wonderful effects of light on the equator. And this is Matisse's hotel room in the Hotel de Ville. Again, I did this much later. But in those days, I made a drawing of the outside. It was just a shell of a building. Now they've turned it back into a hotel, but at that time, it was just an empty shell. I went up to his room. I looked around the whole room and saw the light and the floor and everything and the windows and the things that haven't changed, hadn't changed. And I made a drawing from the outside also of the building. And so years later, I was able to recreate the studio. After that, I went to Italy, to live in Italy. And um, I actually uh, got some lessons from an Italian painter who was teaching me about Cubism, which was, turned out to be very useful in the end. 
but what I was really doing in Italy, well, what I was also doing in Italy, I was painting um, Byron, Keats and Shelley and their travels in Italy. Those are my favorite poets. And I was sort of going to all the places where they had been in Italy and making paintings of them. After that, I went to live in southern Colombia and I bought a coffee farm, a small coffee farm in the mountains overlooking the rainforests. It's the site of the oldest civilization in all of the Americas with waterfalls and stone circles and giant statues everywhere. And in London during one of my ex, I'm sorry, in Los Angeles during one of my exhibitions, I fell madly in love with a young American girl who worked for a conceptual gallery. And uh, after the LA riots, we went to live in Colombia. It was a perfect place really for a young artist to be without any kind of pressure of the modern world. And I really wanted to make paintings about forests. This was something that was deeply meaningful to me. I'd heard about the destruction of the rainforest and I wanted to do what I could to raise some awareness about the situation. I took a lot of art books with me without TV, telephones, newspapers or computers. There was so much time in the day to ride horses, to cook, to paint, to read. I was particularly interested in Picasso's invention of cubism because he'd been endeavoring to bridge the distance between the viewer and the subject. I wanted to try to take this further by actually allowing the viewer to physically walk around inside a painting. Luckily, at that time, British Vogue sent down a photographer to take a thousand photographs and so the, there's a few of them, so you can get a little glimpse of our life there. This is inside our house on the top floor. It's a bed that I made out of the stumps of bamboo, the curved stumps of bamboo, joining them all together. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if you can quite see them, but uh, above the doorway are little encaustic wax pieces, which was one of the first things I made, made there to decorate our home, of all my favorite artists. So there's uh, Bonnard, and Rodin and Pissarro, Van Gogh, someone it's too small for me to see, and Matisse. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, the ceramic pots are things that we generally found in our garden. That's a whole other story, so I better not go into it. But yes, there's a lot of, lot of pre-Columbian things <laughs> around there. So, and that's us coming back from market with the fruit and vegetables. The Indians would lay out their food their fruit and vegetables from their farms on colorful blankets in the market. And once a week, you would go down there with a horse and cart and gather everything you needed for a week. And um, there, I learned to cook down there, which is something I just don't even have time for nowadays. I certainly didn't have time for before. But down there, as I said, there's so much time in the day to, to, to do all those things that you never thought you could do, like read every book you ever wanted to read. Down on the bottom, yes, you can see me feeding a horse. And that's a when I was making a circular painting of the rainforest. Um, that's how I set it up so that I could make the painting a continuous painting. And that's me in my studio. And people in England suddenly got to see us in, the, in this situation. And I mean, it, it's, um, yes, there's a lot of people who've come up to me and said, oh, you're the people from Vogue. We know you from that. <laughs> <laughs> so, there in Colombia, I made four vast landscape paintings. Two of them are 360 degree dioramas made from 12 adjoining panels. I always pick the number 12, 12 months of the year. The first diorama is square in shape. This is just one wall of it and there's th three more walls like this. And it puts the viewer in an ancient garden with a house on one side and the forest on the other. And um, just out of interest, the middle, in the middle, the reason I chose this panel is on the panel on the right hand side, there's, a, there's this hill called La Pelota, the ball, they call it there, really reminded us. We'd see that in our view from our house every day. And it really reminded us of, of like a pregnant woman's belly. And, and behind it, to the left, is a volcano. And I would see that, we would see that volcano every morning while we had our, sipped our coffee at about 5.30 in the morning because there was no electricity, very little electricity in the evening there. So we would get up very early and have our coffee on the balcony. And we'd see the volcano there, this beautiful volcano. And then by six o'clock in the morning, it was covered in cloud and it was gone. 
and most of the time it had snow on it, you could see. And then I started to notice after a few years that every January you could see the volcano all day. So I realized that it was summer up there in January. And so I started to ask people, what's up there? And everybody said, don't go up there, Senor Damian. It's, it's, a, it's a live volcano and, and it's caused earthquakes in Papayan. It's very dangerous. So I asked a friend of mine who, had, who was a guide um, whether he, what was up there. And he said, oh my gosh, it's fascinating. You have to go up there. <laughs> it's, uh, the, the Amazon has a source up there just below the crater of the volcano. And it's on this plateau full of thousands of exotic plants. You're not going to believe how beautiful it is. And it's really a very, very special place. And so I organized to go up there one January. And we'll come back to that in a moment because that became my fourth big installation piece. So. After, this, after that one, I made the circular piece, and luckily Vogue took that picture, but it's the only picture I have, so that's, that's why I had to redo it. Um, this is a detail from that piece. So there were 12 paintings like this, all joined together. And, um, and Hockney saw it, actually, and, he, and he, it inspired him to start joining paintings together and to paint trees, which was a, uh, he's a good friend. And this is a forest. This describes a forest where humans once lived. It's called Forest of Statues because there's statues throughout this forest and you can go around it still today and see these statues. And so this was a very interesting one for me. It showed how we can coexist with trees and leave the trees still standing 2,000 years later. The third one that I made, this, is in a, this was uh, in a forest of mahogany. And my friend, who's the guide, he took me to all these forests. So when we first moved to Colombia, there were forests everywhere. From our house, we had 360-degree view of forests all around, going off into the distance, the volcanoes, those hills, everything. And sadly, it's not like that anymore. And now the forest only exists on the top of mountains, the more inaccessible places. And this particular forest is being looked after by a tribe, uh, some Indians. And two of them offered to take us around. And it's full of animals and birds because without all the rest of the forest down in the lowlands, all the birds and animal, animals have moved to these places. And so we saw troops of very large monkeys that I didn't even know existed in Colombia actually came down and visited us. They were very friendly. All sorts of animals that I never, didn't even know existed, little bears with long snouts for catching ants in the trees and all sorts of things. We were walking around and looking at all of these amazing things. Uh, a, little, a little spider's, well, I think it was a spider, had made this house that looked like a shell out of twigs and his thread. And it was literally shaped like a seashell. And the spider could go in it and go round and round and deep inside the middle. It was so beautiful and a piece of architecture. Um, things like that. And actually, yes, I do want to say that, you know, Colombia for me, Every day I saw some miracle of nature that made me really question things because I'd grown up a Catholic. I'd sort of lost that a little bit after my father died um, for various reasons. But in Colombia, in the forests, I really began to realize that there was something way bigger than just me or us or this world. Or, and, because of the connections between all the different things. And so I'm just going to give you an example because it gives me shivers every time I think about it. But my daughter, when she lived there for her first three years, and one of her favorite things was to go and see butterflies because we have below us a huge forest of giant bamboo um, growing all the way around our land, which actually makes our land very impregnable. That's why I bought that hill. Um, it's OK. so. <laughs> We live in these mountains that are surrounded by three major rivers, the Amazon, the Magdalena, and the Naranjo. And so the early people must have lived there because they could, they could uh, go and trade on the rivers with the Incas and with everybody else. They were never conquered by the Incas. But also because it was fairly impregnable. And so these mountains stick out of the rainforest. And on the tops of each mountain, they've become rounded from tribes living there over the years. And so I managed to buy one of the tops of these mountains that has been rounded. 
And so there was a huge ditch going around the whole place that made it very impregnable and the forest and everything. And so because people asked me, oh, how could you live in seven years in Colombia? Well, our place was, in, you couldn't get to it unless you knew the secret paths to get to our house. And so, and through the forest of bamboo was very difficult. But the butterflies, so every week there was a different, there were different butterflies being born in the, for, in the bamboo forest just below us. And I take my daughter down and we go and have a look. One week, they were black butterflies, but every time they flew around, they were flashing, and some of them flashed white, and some of them flashed red, and some of them flashed blue. And then they would land on these little flowers. Uh, the, the, the only flowers that grow under the bamboo are called impatiens. And the impatiens have three little petals, and they come in three different colors, white, red, blue. And these butterflies were completely black, but on each wing, they had a photographic image of that flower. And so it's beyond Darwin, you know, I mean, yes, Darwin, you can start to imagine, okay, they only mated with the ones that looked like the flower, the only ones of these color, but it just takes you beyond, you know, all of the, your expectations. So these are the kind of things you saw every day down there. So this painting, so I, we were in the forest of mahogany and mahogany trees are 200 feet tall. They're like Greek columns and they rise up and I was wondering how am I going to fit that into a painting you know it's going to, I don't want to make it so small and and so we were wandering around and we came across a clearing and in the clearing one of the trees had fallen down and it was on the ground in pieces and it had fallen down naturally but out of all of the decay little saplings little mahogany saplings were growing out of it and I said to my friend this is the painting I want to do of this I wanted to do a floor painting, so this was the first floor painting, because for me this just described the cycle of life, and actually even the cycle of art and the cycle of many, many, many things. You know that us old ones die and the young ones come, and they fill that space. And um, and then the last painting I made there is called Amazon, and that was on the top of that volcano. And so I went up with my friend. We had to put on plastic suits and rubber boots. And we, climbed, we took a jeep as far as we could up the volcano. And then we got out and we climbed up there. And I took tent pegs and ropes. And when we got to the very top where the crater was, we looked around, went around the crater. We saw the plateau just below it. And we went down and we searched for where the Amazon was coming out of the ground. It's a major source of the Amazon. And it, if it had gone, um, West, it would have just gone through Ecuador a few hundred miles and gone into the Pacific, but it didn't. It wound around the volcano and went all the way through Colombia and Brazil and all the way to the Atlantic. And, um, and it was also, and also it broke off in various parts and became a source of the Magdalena as well and the source of the Naranga, those three rivers that I talked about. And this is, this is a fourth of the painting, and this is on, on the wall in my studio. So you get an idea of how big the whole thing was. And um, it's, these paintings, I call them interactive paintings because by being able to walk inside them with the, with the circular ones or being able to walk on them, the, uh, the viewer is really having an experience of being a part of the painting, especially in this one where they really get to make their own path across the painting and everybody comes with, off it with a different experience and tells us, oh, I saw the bird, the butterfly, the this, the that, the whatever it was, that was part of their experience, their unique experience. And so, you know, that I got from reading my books on Picasso and Cubism, and I'll explain how. And that's another detail from it. So again, I made it in 12 parts. So when I got to the top of the volcano, when I found the plateau, where the, when I found where the water was coming out of the ground, the source, I made a grid around the source and divided it into 12 large paintings. And then I painted each one over the course of a year and a half. And that's uh, when we showed it in Bergamot Station, that's my wife and my two little nieces dancing around on it. And we've showed it in London as well. And one of the things that people have told me, and this was what I was trying to get to as well, is that, that when you Sometimes in a museum, it's a little disappointing because you see how quickly people take in. Well, there's so much art to look at. They look for a few minutes and then they're on to the next and then on to the next and on to the next. And so I really, really wanted to make paintings that really stop people in their tracks. And both galleries reported to me that people look at the, stay with the painting for about half an hour. 
and they wander around and children dance and all sorts of things go on there. So, during our seven years in Colombia, the internet had come into existence. Um, but in 2000, well, in 1989, I showed that painting in Santa Monica. And in 2000, it became dangerous in Colombia. And I decided that we needed to just find an apartment in Santa Monica and move there and wait things out at least or start sending the children to school. And, and my wife was pregnant, actually. So we came back. The internet had been discovered. I bought a laptop computer. One of the first things I did was I Googled Picasso's Bateau Lavoir studio. Suddenly, I was able to see the existing black and white photographs of that studio and all the paintings that Picasso made in that studio. Something like this has a wealth of information for me. Even the color of the frame of the painting that, uh, that, that he's making in there. You can only see part of the painting of a woman with her hand up. Of course, it's from Demoiselle. But you see the color of the frame. You see the color of his palette, the brushes he was using, a bowl that's on the floor of the studio, the skull that he kept in his studio, the books on top of each other, the little cards that he would make, a little Picasso, like so many, I've learned so many methods from Picasso, one of which is if he was stalling about what he was doing, he then miniaturized everything and made tiny little versions of his, of what, of his ideas. And it's a very, very good way to paint. And another thing I learned from him is, is that he never used palettes, I mean, rarely used palettes. Uh, he did back then, but after this, uh, he's rarely used palettes in his studios. He would use cardboard boxes or wooden crates and he'd put the paint directly on that or newspapers and those would absorb all the oil out of the paint. And that's why Picasso was able to make so many paintings. And you see in every, for so many of those studios, you just see rows of canvases against the wall and he was making one every day or every two days. And that's how he did it was that he absorbed all the oil out and so that then when he used that color, it dried really, really quickly, and he was able to keep on painting on it and painting on it. Mm -hmm. And all the sculptures that he made at the time, this is one of the Iberian heads that was stolen from the Louvre for him. Uh, I can't get into that whole story unless you want me to at the end, and you're <laughs> welcome to ask questions there. It's a wonderful story in the John Richardson book. Um, and you can see how that was influencing a sculpture that he was making in that studio of a boy's head. Some people have thought it was Picasso as a boy, but you can see that it's very much that sculpture. All the drawings that he made, Picasso was prolific, as we all know, and he was making about 20 drawings a day, of all, which included many, many drawings of all the objects in his studio. Here you see he's beginning to go cubist with an apple, with a matchbox, and with this decanter. And um, so I was beginning to realize, my goodness, I can, might be able to reconstruct this studio, and if I can, I could actually choose the day that I want to make the painting on. Uh, or at least the week, and go back to his drawings and find the, what was on all the tabletops in that week because it's all recorded there. And I even found a plan of the Bateau Lavoie studio which showed whose studio was, and he was right next to Medigliani and a painter called Urban. Uh, that's not Urban, that's Andre Salmon and Picasso and Medigliani, uh, not far from the, from the Bateau Lavoie studio. So I began to put all the pieces of this puzzle together, and it was a very exciting process. One day, after I'd been drawing from a fragmentary drawing, the one on the left, I noticed that in the bottom right of that painting, or on the right-hand side of that painting, was Demoiselle d'Avignon, the, the left-hand side of, de of one of the Demoiselles. And then I noticed another, in another photograph, which is the one on the right-hand side, there was the, the right-hand side of Demoiselle. So since I knew what Le Demoiselle d'Avignon looked like, I was able to actually put that all together. And I, that was the basis of, of figuring out his whole studio. And then all the other pieces began to fit into place as well. From the, I don't know, 10 existing photographs from, from the Bateau Lavoie. Um, and yeah, I could work out the whole studio. And um, so this is a very well-known postcard that Picasso sent to a friend, I think in Spain, showing where his studio was. And well, the, 
this, he, he actually was living upstairs with Ferdinand and, and um, Fernand Olivier was his girlfriend at that time and with an adopted child and with a dog. And so it was chaos up there. But he wanted to make a very large painting and Leo Stein knew about this. And so Leo offered to rent him a studio, which would be at the far end of the building on the floor below, on the very end, the, the chimney at the very end, that's Picasso's chimney. And so that would be a space where he could make this large painting, which of course turned out to be, we now know as Les Damoiselles d'Avignon. Unfortunately, when Leo came to see this large painting, he rejected it. Few people could reconcile themselves with the African masks that had been added onto three of the women. Leo was heard to remark that thenceforth he would only be buying Matisse's paintings. Luckily, Picasso was not put off by this. He knew he was onto something important and he continued with his, his experiment. This was the beginning of Cubism. Since the Renaissance, artists have been creating an illusion of three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional painting surface by drawing lines in perspective. Picasso's big idea was to paint the background first, in this case a stage with curtains, and then have the subjects protrude forwards by the use of planes. In Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, the idea was to give the viewer the feeling that they could touch the women or pluck the fruit from the table in the front. They might almost feel that they were in the painting, or at least closer than they'd ever had been before. These ideas seem to have derived from Picasso's observations of African sculpture. Picasso said he'd seen no such sculpture before 1907, before he painted this painting. Um, I didn't have to, but you know, John Richardson and plenty of other people surmised that he had. I don't need to be part of that argument because I'm basing my paintings around photographs that were taken in spring 1908, when he definitely was collecting African sculpture. And when he was creating the painting, Three Women, that painting also had a stage with curtains. But the women were even more sculptural and African than in Demoiselle. It was a huge success, that painting. Brack and Duran understood the implications of the new work and Picasso rapidly became the preeminent painter in Paris. This is the very moment that I wanted to examine. My studio paintings always take me to places where I'd like to be a fly on the wall at an extraordinary moment in time. Several existing black and white photographs show three women, describe three women as it was being created. Un unfortunately, just before Leo's next visit, Picasso suddenly painted a whitewash over that entire painting and ruined it. He flattened it to try and make it resemble a Matisse painting. Leo bought it, but didn't really like it and quickly sold it to Sergei Shukin. It went to Russia and was never seen again in Paris. I've painted several versions of the Battle Lava Studio using the, the various photographs of three women as starting points for each different version. The idea was to reconstruct three women as it was before it was ruined, and also see what was going on in the studio at that pivotal moment in Picasso's life during the invention of Cubism. At the bottom left of my painting, there is one of the Iberian Stone Age sculptures that had been stolen from the Louvre and presented to Picasso by a crazy Belgian friend of Apollinaire. He'd overheard Picasso saying how much he loved these Stone Age Iberian sculptures. He put them under his overcoat and brought them to Picasso. And as I said at the end, I'll get into that story if you want to, because it is pretty amazing. It involves the theft of the Mona Lisa and no less. Um, so Picasso based the original heads of all of the demoiselles on that sculpture, on that particular sculpture on the bottom left. And you can still see it in the women in the, in the middle, because those two women retained that ovoid shape. The other three women, as we've said, have the African masks added to them. Um, on the floor is a red cloth that was used to cover up the top portion of Demoiselle, probably because Picasso was tired of the bad reactions. Apparently, Urban's young daughter, who lived next door, would cry after she saw the African faces. I made that cloth in my painting resemble the red cloth in El Greco's The Opening of the Fifth Seal, because Picasso saw that painting at a friend's house during the creation of Demoiselle, and it had a profound influence on the way Picasso handled the, the draperies in his own painting. The various elements on the tabletops and floors, such as bottles, bowls, fruit, vases, 
cups, etc., all featured in Picasso's descriptive drawings and paintings from that period. Various other drawings from April are littered around the place. Picasso's art dealer, Kahnweiler, described the mess and the pile of ashes in front of the stove. The African sculptures on the table on the right-hand side appeared in the photograph, the one we just saw, of Picasso sitting beside his stove in 1908. The drawings on the wall demonstrate how Picasso was examining human form in an African way. The sculpture of an African head next to Demoiselle shows the same thing. As for the style in my painting, I also started with the back wall and brought the elements forward using flat planes, which in this case just happened to be two-dimensional canvases made by Picasso. The exception to this is the window with the Demoiselle curtain next to it. Through that window, one sees Paris fade into the distance using perspective drawing and Fauve's colors. Those were two of the devices that preoccupied Picasso's fellow painters at that moment in time. Another key influence on Demoiselle was Cézanne. Picasso had become very interested in way, the way Cézanne composed his paintings using planes. Cézanne said, and I quote, treat nature by means of the cylinder, the sphere, and the cone. Everything brought into proper perspective so that each side of an object or plane is directed towards a central point. Lines parallel to the horizon give breadth. Lines perpendicular to the horizon give depth. But nature for us men is more depth than surface, whence the need to introduce into our light vibrations represented by the red and yellows, a sufficient amount of blueness to give the feel of air. Well, I think that accurately describes how Picasso and Braque composed their paintings during all of Cubism. So as a nod to Cezanne's influence, I painted an airy blue sky through the window over a representation of Paris that I attempted to create out of cylinders, cones, and spheres. Picasso had taken a photograph from his roof, and exactly 100 years later, I entered the hotel that now exists next to where the Bateau Lavoie had been. I found a room that was closest to Picasso's studio and took a similar photograph. In the center of the window view is a pine tree, which is cone-shaped in my painting. In real life, that tree drops seeds that exist in actual pine cones. Once again, a tree appears as a metaphor in my painting. For me, those seeds are like the ideas that Cezanne passed on to Picasso. Those ideas flourished in Picasso's mind and were then preserved in his own paintings. A century later, I'm trying to enter Picasso's mind to examine his ideas and hoping that I can use them to create something new in my own work. Now I'd like to address the question of how these studio paintings are related to my other paintings of the natural world. In other words, I'd like to explain why, what these paintings mean to me and why I paint them. I think that my landscape paintings try to deal with one of the most pressing issues of our times. The natural world can probably sustain all of the damage that humans are doing to it, and some forms of nature will persist into the future, come what may. That's what I learned from doing the painting on the volcano. But we seem to be ruining the conditions that make this planet viable for our own species, as well as for many others. I make the landscape paintings in an effort to try to convey the feelings that we all have when confronted by the most beautiful places in nature. But I'm also painting places that may not be here in a few years. One London gallery described them as museum exhibits beamed in from the future to remind us. I sincerely hope that that is not the case, and I see positive signs all the time. Just a few days ago, I listened to a BBC report about California running out of water in a year. That was followed by a piece about a man who's invented a machine that turns air into water. Those two stories illustrate the two different threads in my work. For me, the studio paintings are metaphors for human creativity. We are good at destroying things, but we're also highly creative, all of us. I do believe that we have within us the power to solve the major problems of the world, and that is the message that I try to put out there with the studio paintings. And here are a few, this is my studio last week, and this is um, a the painting of a coral reef, the Great Barrier Reef, on the, on, on the wall with the Amazon on the ground. And we're actually, the reason that it's that I'm doing this is uh, we're creating an art park on the Los Angeles River. The whole river is being 
uh, redone by Frank Gehry, which is fantastic, a, a bike path, and it's going to be all joined <laughs> together. Los Angeles River is a, is a mess at the moment because so many, cities grow up on rivers, the rivers get destroyed. Los Angeles River is a case in point, it's covered in cement and you can, can't see the water on nine tenths of it. And part of it will be restored with trees and birds and ducks as, it already, as little parts of it already are. And in any case, they're going to put art parks along the river. This is going to be one of the art parks. And one of the art parks. <laughs> so these are a few of my other studio paintings. This is um, Cezanne's studio during the creation of the bathers. And I quickly put this on here because I looked at Janie's show today and saw how much the bathers figured in it. And so I wanted to be able to see this. So for example, I go to Cezanne Studios, a museum, which I recommend going to in Aix-en-Provence, and I go to a place like this, and they say, okay, you, you know, you can stay in there 30 minutes. So I'm 30 minutes sitting at a little desk, realizing this was Cezanne's desk. <laughs> and, um, and I'm making my drawing, and I'm listening to the uh, guides going around and telling everybody, this is the way Cezanne had the studio, it's been like this since he died, and over and over, and all of this stuff. And then, yes, well, the fun thing in this was at the end, they said, really, was it like this? And I was like, yes, it was like this, actually. And so I think they put it back the way it was. <laughs> um, this is Gauguin's studio in 1895. And um, Gauguin's studios, there's plenty of material to gather for all the studios. The, the trunk that he brought from France, the, the, there's a chest of drawers that the painting is leaning against over there. Um, there's all the paintings he did, there's everything. Um, there's so much. And there's the place that he lived, and you examine that place. And, but he, this is beyond the Battle of Lavoie. And the further you go back in time, of course, the more you have to use your imagination. But I do think that all of them, there's imagination involved because like any painting, any painter has to use their imagination <coughs> as well. So they're great challenges. This one, I'm the only one I'm going to say who owns it, but this one is owned by Donald Sutherland, which I was very pleased because he played Gauguin in the film called Wolf at the Gate. And he went into my gallery in New York, uh, I think a year later, and said something amazing to them. He said something I could, it just puts me in a good mood every day, every, day, every time I look at it. So that's, that's really nice. This is Monet's studio, his first studio, uh, Giovanni. And um, it's still there. He built a, sec a larger studio in the garden where he could make his huge paintings of water lilies. And unfortunately that obscured the view of this beautiful studio. But here you get to see how it was and the paintings that he kept on the walls there mm. and his desk. This is Matisse's studio in Collior. Um, I'm quite pleased with this one because, so I made this painting before I went to Collior. And I had some, the various evidence that I had was I had Matisse's, had taken two photographs and he'd made the painting Open Window Collier in this studio as well, which everybody knows it's, has the, it's a beautiful Fauvis painting with the boats in the water. And, but the photograph showed something different. It showed this town in the background, the port. And so I thought, well, you know, it's Fauvism and he's abbreviating and he's taken out the port because he doesn't want to show the port. But I go there and I start asking everybody and there's a lot of Matisse tourism everywhere where Matisse and Duran made a Fauvis painting. There's a little plastic plinth and a photocopy of that painting. And so the tourists are going around from one to the other. And here in front of this building or in front of, on the beach there, there were lots of plinths. So I thought, ah, I'm coming close. So then I asked the men on the beach who were playing bull. I said, where do you think this photograph was taken? Showed the Matisse's photograph. And they asked me why and I said, because Matisse took this photograph from his studio. And they said, no, no, the studio is over in the port. And that's where they direct everybody because after 1907, Matisse rented a different building over in the port. And that's where he went for his holidays after that, ever since. So nobody in Collier had a clue about this studio. So I said, okay, well, it doesn't matter. Where do you think this photograph was taken? Look at the windows on this. And they said, oh yes, there's only one building that has those windows above the doors. And it's over there behind that gigantic tree which is the little tree on the left in the window in my painting, because it's 100 years earlier. This is 1905, I was there in 2005. It's become an enormous tree blotting out. And moreover, the little tables and chairs that you see on the beach through the railing, that, that's now a big fancy restaurant there on the beach. So I knew that I had the right place. And on the ground floor, they were renting out apartments and I knocked on the door and said to them, 
do you own the floor above you? And they said, oh yes, that's our office. And I said, well, would you mind if I have a look? And they, we went through the whole thing, no Matisse's house is over in the port. And I said, okay, <laughs> fine, but um, could I have a look? And they said, oh yes, of course you can, we've just redecorated. So as I was going up the little stairs in the back, of, I was thinking, my heart was sinking. I was thinking, oh no, a hundred years it's been like this. Now they've just redecorated it. <laughs> and sure enough, <laughs> plastic floor and yellow walls, and it was you know, fairly hideous and the way they had it, office equipment everywhere. But as soon as I opened those doors, I recognized them immediately, the glass above the doors, and I knew that we were in Matisse's studio. And the balcony was different. And so I looked in the balcony and I looked on the walls on each side of the balcony there were little screw holes, two on the top and two at the bottom where they would, had joined. I showed the photograph that Matisse had taken of his window and I said, was this the balcony that was here? And they said, yes, 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 it was very old and broken up. And, and I said, you know, I, have, I said, well, what do you think? This is, Matisse took this from his studio. And they were like, oh my God, we're in Matisse's studio. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know what? You, if you just put it back the way that it was last week or last month or whenever you did this, you could have the Matisse muse Museum here. Can you get the balcony back and just put an easel? You know? and, um, and then I noticed that there was another window exactly like this one. And I opened up the doors on the other window and realized, ah, magic moment. This is how, why he painted on the right-hand side, he painted open window collier. On the left-hand side, he took his photograph with the port in the background. And so it explained what had been going on there. And so they let me stay in there all afternoon and paint and draw and everything. And I said to the woman, I said, well, you know, there was a paint, there was a poster. As I was coming in downstairs by your office, there was a poster on the wall. And she said, oh, I forgot to tell you, Damien, um, I'm on the board of the, museum here in Collioure and there's a painting coming from Paris that has never been back in Collioure since he painted it and you must come to the opening it's next week um, uh, you know I've been helping send out all the invitations and everything I said can we go and have a look at it we went to have a look at it and it was his painting of open window Collioure and I said, well, isn't that your window? She said, I'm so embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, I've been <laughs> mailing these invitations and doing the poster and, <laughs> and uh, so anyway that was that um, and it, just, I don't, I don't know how much time we have, but as the, at the very end of this trip, I'd been going all the way across the south of France, going to every single studio I could find, made my list of way ahead of time, and I'd visited everything. And I had a show opening in Lefebvre Gallery in London at that same time of some of these studio paintings from the year before. And, but I was trying to pack everything in. So I went to the Matisse Museum in Nice. And in the Matisse Museum in Nice, they made me check my backpack into one of the little lockers. And I went upstairs, I kept my phone with me, which had a camera, of course, and I was, you know, quietly photographing all of these materials and fabrics and all of his possessions that are in the museum, which I highly recommend to go and see. And of course, I'd never seen the, the, what colours they were before, so it was going to help me make hundreds of more Matisse paintings if I needed to, of the ones that I hadn't done. Not hundreds, but, you know, a few that I hadn't done. And so I'm photographing all these things, I'm going around, and then I realize, oh my God, my plane is leaving for London, the opening is tonight. I rush to the airport, I get to the airport, and I realize I've left my backpack in that locker uh -huh. with all of my sketchbooks and drawings from all of the studios, the Cezanne studios, everywhere else that I visited in the south of France. And so I had a moment of, what am I gonna do? Do I miss the opening of my show? Or do I leave my backpack here? And I decided to leave the backpack there. I had visited the Villa California um, that week as well, and the, woman, uh, the guard at the door had said, listen, come back next week, and my uh, Picasso is here, and I'm sure she'll let you have a look around. So I thought, okay, I'll come back next week after the show's open. So, of course, when I got to London, the next morning I called the museum, and I asked them, you know, did you find a backpack? And they said, the museum director wants to talk to you. And I said, oh, really? And I thought, oh dear, they've got me on video photographing. <laughs> what did I do? And she said, you know, I have my back, your backpack on my desk and I've been looking through it. And what are you doing? It's very interesting. What are these drawings? And what, are, and what is this? You know, so she said, when you come back, please do come to my office. I want to talk to you about these. And I was thinking, you know, what? We got back there and she centered on the drawings that I'd done in Collioure with the two windows of the studio and everything. She said, what is this? And I said, well, this is Matisse's studio. And she said, no, but it's in the port. And I said, well, yes, but no. In, in 1905, he had a studio over with Deran and they were overlooking the bay right here. And she said, oh, no, 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 of course, my predecessor knew that and everything. She went to her books and she got out all these books and everything like that. 
couldn't find anything. <laughs> I said, you know what, that should be the Matisse Museum in Collio. And I don't know if they've ever done that, but it should be anyway. So this is Picasso's studio in the Boulevard Clichy in Paris. And this is another funny story. I don't know if I'm running late or if you want to hear these stories. Or... <laughs> okay. So this one, this one, I go, um, Sidney Picasso was helping me in Paris with locating all of the Picasso studios. And this was one of the ones that they hadn't really been into. Well, they hadn't been into since Picasso died. And, um, and it's 11 Boulevard Clichy. And I went there. And I'm looking on the door. My French isn't very good. So I look for an English name on the door and I bring the buzzer and I said, excuse me, um, I'm looking for Picasso's studio, which I'm sure is in this building. And the man said, um, my English isn't very good because I've lived here 50 years. But if you're looking for an artist studio, there's an artist studio building in the back. And um, I'm, that's what you're looking for. Let me let, and he let me in. So I went to the studio building in the back and I'd drawn the studio before just with charcoal quite a few times. And one of the things I'd noticed is it had a curved window. And I looked up at the building and only the studios on the top floor had a curved window. So I knew his studio was on the top floor. Then I looked at all those and I looked at the photograph that Picasso had taken. And I realized that the only window that he could see Sacre Coeur from was the studio up in the top right hand corner. So I knew I had my Picasso studio. And so I went upstairs, knocked on the door, nobody was there. So I thought, okay, I'm all the way here, you know, across the hall, they've got the same window, the same light, the same sky, not the Sacre Coeur, but most of the buildings, um, probably the same floorboards, knocked on the door, nobody was there. Then I went downstairs just below, I said, okay, they don't have the window, but they've got most of those other features, <laughs> knocked on the door, no one was there. Just then, the little tiny French elevator started coming up through the building, shaking as it came up very slowly. And I saw that it was going to Picasso's studio. And I went up the stairs, trying not to scare the people who came out, got out my Lefebvre catalogue. And I said, excuse me, I'm making paintings of all of Picasso's studios in Paris. Would you mind if I have a look at this one? And the woman looked at me and she said, hmm, I wouldn't normally let you in, but I'm here with my boyfriend. And I do want to know if this was Picasso's studio. She said, when my father gave me this apartment, he said, this is Picasso's studio, but I don't know, can you tell me? So we go in, the first thing she shows me is a picture on the wall, it's a photocopy of a painting that Picasso made. She said, my father told me that Picasso painted this from his bedroom. I said, what do you think? So we take the photocopy and we go to the back bedroom and I have photographs that Picasso took of the bedroom at that time, we're looking outside. I said, yes, it's a cubist version of the view we see with a cafe and the tree and nothing's changed really. And can we look in the studio? She said, of course, you look in the studio. So we go into the studio and I show her the photograph that Picasso had taken of this window and the view of Sacre Coeur and immediately she said, oh my goodness, this is my studio. <laughs> and so she let me stay there for about three hours and I, that's how I made that painting. And, and by the way, Picasso, yeah, he was, this is right after the Bateau Lavoie. You can actually see the Bateau Lavoie. It's in front of Sacre Coeur there. And he'd now begun to make some money from the Cubist paintings, not from Demoiselle, because he couldn't sell it. But he began to make some money from the Cubist paintings. And he was now buying musical instruments because somebody had told him that the Cubist paintings looked like music. And so he thought, well, let's paint a woman making music. And it was better than the woman reading the book theme that's gone on for a hundred years. And you can see his dealer on the right hand side is Volard. Um, you can see, you know, the African sculpture on the table that's in the photograph as well. And you can see up in the very top left hand corner, this one got cropped a little bit much, but it's, uh, it's Matisse's painting of his own daughter. Picasso swapped paintings with Matisse and this is the one that Picasso chose. I, would, I don't know how I would feel if I swap a painting with an artist and he chooses the one of my daughter, you know. <laughs> but flattered for her, but I, those are the paintings that mean the most to you in the end. You know? So anyway, and so yes, he had seen a show of, um, was it uh, Courbet who was painting music, women with musical instruments? That gave him the idea, I think. And um, this is, I included this one as well, this is a watercolor and charcoal. And this is Picasso's studio in the Rue Cholcher. He had one studio in between, which I've also painted the Boulevard Raspail, but I couldn't put fit everything in. So here I chose Cholcher because there in the back is Demoiselle d'Avignon hanging on the wall. Uh, eight years later, it still hasn't been sold. 
um, I think it was sold the next year, 1916, finally, for the very low price, ends up in MoMA, it's probably the most expensive painting in the world. Um, but so this was in 1915 in the Rue Chaucher, and I've done quite a few different versions of gouaches and other sides of the studio, because I got to go in this one as well. This again, Sidney Picasso helped me. Well, she said again, we'd, nobody from the Picasso family has been in there since then, but I do know that an architect lives there. So I prepared myself for an architect opening the door. So I wait outside for a while. It's right opposite the Montparnasse Cemetery. Um, and finally a man comes along, he's holding a baguette and he's got his groceries and things and he opens the door and I ask him, I said, excuse me, I'm fairly certain that this is Picasso's studio and here I've made paintings. So this is my book from Lefebvre. Um, you can see that I'm making paintings of all of Picasso's studios. Would it be okay to have a look? And he said, well, it's not my studio, but come in. My wife's a painter. We have a studio in the back. Talk to her. She'll love what you're doing. And I'm sure she'll help you get in there. And so we go to the back room. As soon as he opens his door, his wife chastises him and says, I just sent you to get groceries. What's taken so long? And, and who the hell is this? <laughs> and so she looks at my book and and she's very happy with the, and to help me. And she says, come on, let's go to the studio. He normally takes a nap at this time. Let's go and see if we can find get him. And so this man opens the door. He's got the bolt on. He's looking really tired. He's not going to let me in. I could, and I said, excuse me, I'm making paintings of all Picasso's studios in Paris. And I'm making a painting right now of this one. And, I'm, and I really would like to know how it's changed since Picasso's time since he was an architect, he stood up and he's like, oh, let me show you what I've done. I've added another floor in here, I've done this, put a fireplace over here, I've done that. Well, it ends up letting me stay for two or three hours during which time I was able to recreate the studio from every different angle. Then this is his next studio. He's now becoming quite wealthy, Picasso, and the only photographs of him painting at this time, he's wearing a cravat and a suit, and he's married to Olga, and who wanted him to make classical paintings. That's Stravinsky in the middle that he did a, a charcoal drawing of. And um, this is now occupied by accountants. And so they were all quite amused by that I was recreating and changing everything. And you know they wondered how it was all possible. And uh, this is Frida Kahlo's studio in Koyakan. And you can go to the Casa Azul, which I highly recommend. It's a wonderful house that she has there and visit her. And you'll find that this is her first studio no longer really exists. It's just an empty room. They've even filled in the doors and windows. So it's just a cube of a room with nothing in there at all. Um, I went to talk to the director, told him what I was doing, showed him photographs of what I was doing. And he said, yes, that's fine, but you're not allowed to draw or take photographs in any of the rooms. Uh, this is Matisse's studio in Nice. That was that same trip that I was make, go, driving along the coast and going to all of the different studios, all the way from Dali in the northern Spain to Collioure, which is just across the border, although you have to drive hours together. And then all the way along the coast, Cezanne and Matisse and Picasso Barnard, whose house is just now an empty shell you can walk around. I don't know why nobody's converted it. Um, all sorts of houses. And what I noticed is that in Nice, um, where Matisse chose to live, the ocean there has this incredible color that doesn't exist in the whole of the rest of the south of France. So this is what I wanted to convey in this painting, one of the things. And this is his balcony and all the plants that he would use as props in his paintings. Um, this is Picasso's studio after the war and all of the paintings that he'd done and the dim, probably the electric light as you see on the left hand side. And below, this you can visit as well. It's an empty shell, but you can visit it. It's open to the public. The Rue Grande Augustine, I love it. The floor below is owned by the same people. They don't let you go in there. <coughs> that's where he created Guernica. And that's where I really wanted to do a painting as well. And I'm going to do that painting because, again, I took some photographs, even though they wouldn't let me take any photographs. <laughs> um, so that's coming up. And, uh, but so this is upstairs. And one of the interesting things about the, in the Grand Magazine and that really got me started in making studios was that uh, once there was a photographer visiting Picasso in the Grand Magazine, and, he, and he, when Picasso came in to be photographed, he noticed that the photographer had moved his slippers. And he said to him, uh, you need to put back the slippers because the way an artist places his things tells you as much about the artist as his paintings do. And that was kind of one of the th early things that inspired me to go 
and paint other studios to, to see how people place their things what, and what it was you could learn from the, about their mind by the way they had it all set up. This is Matisse's studio in Vance. Again, it's kind of an empty shell of a building. They rent it out to students. Uh, and it's, it's, um, it's hard to find. It's opposite the chapel, not far from the chapel. I, again, I recommend going there. It's the house that he built for himself. And um, I had done drawings from his window, of, of photographs from his windows. And so I knew where Saint Paul de Vance, well, where the tower was. And so I went up and down the road until I saw exactly the angle of how, the tower, how I'd drawn it in Saint Paul de Vance. And then I went up that driveway and there was his house, Villa La Reve. And I went inside and I started making my drawings and paintings and the students who were there for a couple of weeks were quite amazed because the place is just full of graffiti and it's just not very well looked after. And this was fun for me, you know, just, I love, like everybody, we love his cutouts and just seeing how, you know, of course there's some black and white photographs of this place, but how putting the, everything back in color and how coordinated all the colors were, even if you had all of the different cutouts in the same room. This is my first painting I did of Picasso's Villa La Californie studio. And um, here he's painting his wife. And this is a kind of unusual moment in Picasso's life. And what drew me originally to the studio was that um, for about two years, the whole house had remained fairly empty and barren. He'd bought it with Francois Gillot who he had two children with, Claude and Paloma. And then he, she left him. And she's, you know, she was one of the great survivors of Picasso, actually. And she went off and became a painter, a very good painter. But she left him and he was depressed. And it was really one of the only kind of fallow periods in Picasso's life. He made a few paintings of a model called Sylvie. They're really not his best. And, um, but what he did is he did make a lot of drawings and etchings of the model the, the artist and his muse. And um, it's an extraordinary series of etchings, but he didn't make many paintings at that time. So the whole place was empty. And then suddenly he met Jacqueline, who's in the painting on the left-hand side. And he this suddenly filled every single room on the ground floor with artwork. Every, every surface was covered in artwork. And that's what really drew me to this, because this amazing moment of innovation going on. And what he had done is he first of all, painted Jacqueline looking like one of the women of Algiers. And he'd made a painting in every single room of Jacqueline and put Jacqueline on the wall in every room. And then he made a few paintings of his own studio and they're very abbreviated paintings as Picasso made. And then he started to make paintings of Jacqueline in the studio in front of a painting. And that, that's the one on the, on the easel. And he also made about five of those as uh, one in the Spleen Museum. Um, and so there's one in each room as well in, well, in my painting. So I, after making this, I decided to try and make a reconstruction of the entire ground floor because I'd been making those huge paintings in Colombia. And one of the things I learned from making the 360 degree paintings was that when I took them down or put them up and I only had half of the painting up, then suddenly it was, we don't see life in some frame we see life about 250 degrees, all the way from here to here, we see. And so that's, I became very interested in making paintings that really kind of investigate that and show the world that we, so I decided to make a painting as if you were arriving at Picasso's front door in April, 1956, and it was all of the three rooms that you could see as if you were arriving there. And all of that, and luckily everything had been photographed because he was so proud of this moment in his life when he'd done this painting and he allowed two photographers to go around and photograph everything. They took photographs, little photographs of everything on the tabletops and this painting and that painting. And so I, the first year I just joined all, everything I could together and made a gigantic <coughs> jigsaw puzzle on the walls of my studio. And, um, and, and, and that's how I made the painting. And so you see the Grand Salon first, which is where he was making ceramics. On the left-hand side is the studio where he's making his paintings. One of the things that I learned while I was making this painting um, was just how much of a genius Picasso was because what he was doing in his own studio was beyond what I could imagine anybody would be doing. The most famous studio painting ever painted was Las Meninas and um, uh, made by Velasquez. 
when Picasso was young, he was told by his father that Velasquez is a great Spanish painter, possibly you'll never be this good, and you know, Velasquez is it. Went, took him to the Prado and showed him. And actually what was going on is, I realized that Picasso in his own, well, this is the Grand Salon where he's making all the ceramics. You see a pram, sorry, this, I just said, you know, got off on a different subject for a moment. Um, so in this one, you see a pram that's been taken to pieces in the Nestrola, you call them here, uh, in the middle of the room because Paloma and Claude were now old enough. Um, Sidney Picasso saw this whole painting together and she spent three hours with it and went around and told me details like nobody knows except the Picasso family. And um, so there were so many different things. But in this painting, for example, on the sofa, there's Claude's little drawing of a bullfight that he made for his father, a little watercolor, pour mon papa chéri, it says on it, for my darling father. Above it, this little um, cherries, bowl of cherries, Sidney said, is a secret port portrait of Francois Gillot. I can't quite understand it, but that's what she said. And um, he had taken down everything of Francois Gillot in the house, except for this little secret portrait, because he did love her still in some way, of course. Um, so on the left-hand side, you see him, you see, first of all, Demoiselle d'Avignon in a poster. Somebody had probably made a print for him of Demoiselle d'Avignon. And you see how it's influencing everything around it. On the floor is two of the two women, a big etching that he'd done. That uh, clearly comes from the woman on the right-hand side in Demoiselle. Uh, on the, above it and next to it, you see Jacqueline as one of the women of Algiers. So Picasso was taking on different painters in his life at this point. This is the point in his life when he started. And I have to go back a little bit. During the war, after the war, Francois Gillot tells a story where he gave some of his paintings to the Louvre. And the director of the Louvre said, you must come and see how your paintings hold up against the great masters of the past. And he was quite nervous, but they took him and they first showed him some of his paintings next to Delacroix. And the director said, see, they hold up. Then he said, let's go and see them next to Velasquez. And, and uh, Francois said he was sweating bullets at that point. And they went and put them next to Velasquez. And the director said, see, they hold up. And so he, I'm sure he was very pleased with that. Um, but so then he decided to take on all of these different masters and do his own. And so here he's taking on Delacroix with making his, his wife look like one of the women of Algiers. Um, and then what I learned, which was quite extraordinary is, and this is not part of that series, but I made it afterwards to encapsulate everything that I'd learned, which is um, that, so the, the painting in the back, again, actually that's the only painting of clearly of Francois Gillot, and he put it in his studio, he suddenly put it up in his studio, and art critics have never quite wondered, have never quite figured out why, since he took down everything else of Francois, um, why that painting was put back up there. And that is a painting called The Shadow, and it's Picasso's shadow on Francois the day before she left him. She was asleep, naked, up, supposedly upstairs on a sofa, and, his, and he came into the room, his shadow fell over her, and that painting he made after she left. And he made two versions of it, and he put one on the wall right here. And then I remembered something about Picasso's painting of Las Meninas, his first big black and white painting of Meninas. And I remembered one of the art critics saying, we don't quite know why he painted the Chamberlain in the doorway into a shadow. And perhaps it's Picasso in the doorway. And I looked back at that painting that he made of Las Meninas with his dog in it and the, everything else. And another strange thing, he'd made Picasso, he'd made Velasquez about 15 feet high next to his easel on the left-hand side. And I realized that Picasso was placing everything in this studio to, to resemble Las Meninas. It had the three windows on the right-hand side, just as a, two windows and a mirror in his studio. Yeah, and he was actually going to re he went upstairs after this and painted 50 versions of Las Meninas. Mm -hmm. And then I realized uh, that other thing, why did he paint Velasquez 15 feet high next to the easel on the left-hand side in his big black and white painting that's in, in the Picasso Museum in Barcelona? And I suddenly realized he painted him to look like that mirrored door, which is about 15 feet high. And, Velasquez is actually faceted just like that mirrored door. 
And so there's a couple of things going, yeah, there's a couple of things going on there. One of them, he's probably saying, an artist is like a mirror of all the world around him. And the other thing is that he was solving the conundrum, which we now know, and Picasso was probably one of the first people to figure it out, that the only way Velasquez could have painted that painting was by looking in a mirror. So he painted them as a mirror. <laughs> so these are the kind of things that you do figure out from looking at Picasso, to a painting Picasso's studios. This is Calder's studio. Actually, his studio is in the garden, but I like to paint the places where the ideas are really going on. And this was his kitchen and his kitchen table. He's surrounded by all his carpets that he was making at the time, the mobiles above him. And this is where he worked out the next mobiles. This is Warhol's factory in 1964. I very luckily got to know Warhol a little bit when I was at Harvard. And um, he came up and, and, and took photographs of us, actually. One day, he must go to the Warhol Museum and find some. Um, but yes, he was very interesting and learned, learned a lot from that. And this is Dali's studio. Again, the museum director said to me here, look, we, the tours are going around. Every 20 minutes, it's a different tour. So really, I can only give you an hour in the studio. He came back four hours later, and I'm still there drawing. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I take advantage of these things. <laughs> but, you, you know, once you're in there, it's so inspired. So he came back and he looked and said, Damien, I, please, you know, you can't stay four hours. You have, you've got to go in there. And I said, well, it's okay, I'm finished. And he said, you're not finished. You've only done two walls. Little did he know that I, that's what I was planning to do anyway, because Dali had made a painting of Las Meninas where he painted Las Meninas floating in the clouds. And you only saw two walls of the studio. And so that was my plan, was always to do this. And so I then left the tour, had to go on the tour, left the tour at a certain point, went up onto the roof of, of Dali's studio and connected the landscape that I'd seen through the windows to what I saw from the roof, the rest of the landscape. So that's how I did that one. And um, there is a lovely story about that one too, which is that um, Olivia Harrison, George Harrison's wife came to buy a painting for him of a Gauguin studio. And she saw this one in the background as well. She said, oh my goodness, George went to that studio in 1973 and he's been trying to describe it to me for years and I can't understand what he's talking about. <coughs> Dali was making a painting of himself in a painting, painting his wife. He's reflected in a mirror. I just don't get it. This is wonderful. I'm buying it for George. <laughs> so that was a nice one. Um, this is Peter Doig's studio in Chelsea, in the Chelsea Art School, actually, in 1990. This, of course, is Jeff Koons' studio. And, um, and uh, yeah, so that's uh, in 1994. And this, again, is his office. And this is before he made the balloon dog into a metal sculpture. This is a, it was a balloon. And it would, didn't have all the high gloss on it or anything. So that amused me as to finally birth of that idea. Um, this is Lucian Freud's dog, quite different. And here he's just been painting his dog in a painting and the model has got up and left and the dog is stretching its legs as well. And I made this, as I often do from a video, I'm not that fond of making paintings from photographs. So I try and find videos of these studios. So I'm gonna find, because that photo will be known in the end and it won't be so interesting. But if you make them from videos, you pick your own place to make the painting and it becomes more interesting. In this one, I was able to extend, because I'd seen the camera pan across the room, I was able to get much more in it than the video even. And one of the things that was going on in the video was Lucian Freud always taking the paint that he wasn't using and flicking it on the walls and flicking it on the floors. And I really like that, so <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to get that. And this is Ai Weiwei's studio in Beijing. And here he's making the ceramics. And now with Instagram, it's pretty amazing. But last week I put this on Instagram and Ai Weiwei liked it. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of fun. And, um, and yeah, so here he's making the ceramic balls. And it's a huge long story with this one. Too. That's his wonderful work. And then people always ask me, well, what about your studio? Yes, I have painted my studio. I'm not going to show you that. I'm just going to show you a few photographs to end it um, with of my studio. This is when I was making the Amazon painting, when I exhibited it in London in 2010, I thought, well, this time I'd like to give experiment and not leave the walls blank and perhaps put something on the, on the walls. And so I remembered that when I was in 
Colombia, making this painting over that year and a half, I was investigating about the Indian tribes that live in the Amazon. And many of them had the same myth that the source of the Amazon, where the water comes out of the ground, for them, in their mythology, is the first woman and all life came out of her. And I thought, ah, that's what I want to put on the walls, sort of cave paintings of that first woman, but asleep in that environment. And so there's another one. And that there is next to, you can see the size of these paintings, they're quite large. That's the Collier painting once I'd been there and painted the, the studio with the two windows. And this is me recreating the, one of the Bateau Lavoie studios. And you can see some of the research that goes into these paintings, all of the different photographs that one can gather. It's a lot. And you can see even the top right, that photograph of, on, of yes, Andre Salmon standing in front of the three women. This is um, another of those, I call them goddesses, but the women, the sleeping women, let's say. Um, and next to a Warhol's factory. This is me painting a Gauguin studio. And in the background is the Villa de la California part of the installation. This is some more, that's, you know, I make them on paper first and then I make them on canvas. This is my studio last week again with some of the coral reef painting going on. That's my studio when the goddesses were in it. This is a bull. So every year I try and paint a bull. It was since 1990 anyway, every year I've tried to paint a bull. Um, it was just after a conversation that I had with my wife about facing our fears. And, um, and so, yes, I, it's and kind of brings back the graffiti painting and everything. And, and also graffiti painting for me is very much connected with cave painting. And I love the idea. I, my father was a painter, my grandfather was a painter. I love how painting has been passed down since cave painting. And so that really fascinates me. And of course, every painter, we want that connection to cave painting. Luckily, I was gored by a bull. And so I can paint bulls like Picasso did. And, <laughs> and um, that's me in my studio, my wife took. And that's me painting my goddess, my wife. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>